Hi, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today titled Exosomes, Exploiting the Diagnostics and Therapeutic Potential of Nature's Biological Nanoparticles. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen and I will be your facilitator today. Okay, so let me introduce you our guest speaker, Nias Khan, whom I've shamelessly and eagerly invited countless times to share his wealth of experience in exosome research with us. Um, so I'm glad that COVID-19 gave us the opportunity to collaborate. Nias is currently an MD, PhD candidate from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He completed his, his undergraduate studies at the University of Pittsburgh with majors in neuroscience, bioengineering, and mathematics. He's from Virginia, where he attended Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Okay, Nias, whenever you're ready, please go ahead and share your screen. Thank you very much, Julie, and uh, thank you for being so persistent in getting this webinar series uh, up to uh, getting me to participate in this webinar series. So uh, I also want to thank the audience that's here today, as well as the audience that will be um, listening to this webinar later, um, and give me the opportunity to talk about a, a topic that's been quite near and dear to my heart, especially over the last few years during my PhD uh, regarding exosomes. And so. You know, my, my story really started um, back in 2016 when um, in between summers, between first and second year of medical school, I rotated in the lab of Dr. Alan Faden, who, who organizes the lab for the study of central nervous system injury at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. And it was during the, my rotation in this lab that I got really interested in, uh, in exosomes. And so, um, and it's, I was so interested in it that I didn't, um, uh, rotate in the other two labs I thought I would in, rotate in, and I said, okay, well, Dr. Faden, I'm going to join your lab, and this is what I'm going to do, and and here I am three years or four years later, um, much further along in that process. So um, just some background in terms of CNS injury. When we when we talk about any kind of uh, injury to the central nervous system, we generally classify it in terms of two phases. There's a primary injury phase and a secondary injury phase. And so the primary injury refers to the original event that um, uh, caused the caused the insult, um, whether it's a brain injury or a spinal cord injury. And at that time, there are mechanical forces that cause uh, neuronal damage, and um, those are largely ir irreversible. Um, and that's a largely an irreversible condition. There's also a second phase beyond the actual insulting event um, that's referred to as the secondary injury cascade, and there are multiple pathways that contribute to this progressive injury that extends, you know, after the initial event. And so one of those in particular that's really important is uh, inflammation and that our lab has studied for a very long time. And when we take a look at what's happening at, in the CNS, um, when, when there's an injury, uh, there are molecules that are released from neurons that can uh, be sensed by microglia, which are kind of the immune surveillance cells in the brain and in the spinal cord, and they become activated to this. They're like first responders in this injury response. And, and they can become activated along a spectrum of different phenotypes. And, and generally, we kind of classify them into a, a, a phenotype that's more pro-inflammatory um, with certain molecules that are associated with that, as well as more of an anti-inflammatory uh, phenotype. And, and generally, in the injury response, you, you kind of start off with this pro-inflammatory phenotype and then transition to this more reparative phenotype um, uh, as part of the, pro the natural endogenous process. Um, but what our lab's also shown is that um, surprisingly after uh, CNS injury, there does seem to be a very persistent um, activation of these microglia in this pro-inflammatory like state that can last for weeks to months, even up to a year post-injury. And that can continue to, to contribute to cell loss after that event. And so being able to target this mechanism to prevent this or, or limit this chronic neuroinflammation after injury is an important opportunity for therapeutic intervention in, in, in neurotrauma in general. And so as we were trying to think of what would be, what are some of the mechanisms that lead to this chronic activation of, of microglia, we came to the idea of extracellular vesicles. And so an extracellular vesicle is um, just defined as any membrane-bound structure with a lipid bilayer that's released from a cell. And they're released from a cell, they've got all kinds of cargo, um, proteins, lipids that form the membrane, um, RNA species, and in some cases people have 
uh, found that DNA may be associated with them. And so really vesicles, extracellular vesicles are released by all cell types and they're part of natural communication processes, but they can also, their, their content and their biological effect can be modified depending on a, a stimulus or a pathological condition. So there's been a lot of um, interest in that sense in, in, in studying extracellular vesicles. What do they do? What do they carry? And what does it mean for both physiology and uh, pathophysiology? And so it wasn't always like this, though, that this is kind of dogma. Um, actually, the probably the first description of extracellular vesicles came back in uh, the early, the mid 1900s, um, where it was identified that there was a component in plasma uh, that was different from the cells, that was different from the platelets, but had some of the same properties as platelets. Um, if you would take this little, this substance that was isolated, it would have some of the same coagulant property as, as platelets but they very clearly determined that they weren't platelets themselves. And so at that time, it was described by, by Dr. Peter Wolf in 1967 as platelet dust, things that were sedimentable by high-speed centrifugation and originating from platelets, but distinguishable from them. So it, they were just at that time thought to be dust or particulate matter. And, and, and for a, quite a long period of time, it was just thought that, that vesicles could be a mechanism by which cells were um, releasing contents from them and not really participating in biological processes themselves. Um, but uh, as I stated before, that's not true anymore. And one of the very interesting things is that you can find them in all sorts of biological fluids. So not only in plasma, but in CSF and saliva and urine. And so that has three major implications um, for science and medicine, really. So one is that they could be used as potential diagnostic markers. Two, if they're circulating in fluids like plasma and CSF, it could be a mechanism by which uh, different cells in different organ systems could be communicating with each other. And three, if we understand that biology, we also may be able to manipulate vesicles to be sorts of nanoparticle-like drug delivery uh, carriers or a drug delivery system. And so a lot of research so far has focused on EVs as biomarkers for disease. Um, so particularly in cancer and neurological disease, there are many pathological proteins that are hallmarks of those particular diseases. And um, many of those proteins have been found in association with vesicles that get released from cells. Additionally, there's been interest in looking at RNA signatures within these vesicles as well to uh, assess their biomarker and diagnostic potential. At the basic research level, we're still under, trying to understand what vesicles do in all these different contexts. So um, this is just an example here of what could be happening in the CNS after uh, a stressful inflammatory or an injury condition. And as you can see, there's some, a lot of lines drawn here that connect one cell to another and involve a, a vesicle there, some sort of transfer of cargo that impacts the recipient cell. And um, additionally, and a lot of this work, frankly, has been done at the cell culture level. And m most work in this space has been done in, in cell culture systems. And it's only been until more recently that we've been trying to understand how these mechanisms are, are working in vivo as well. And, and indeed, our lab has contributed to some of this data here um, in terms of how microglia could promote further microglial activation through the release of vesicles that hit other microglia as well as transfer of vesicles into the blood circulation. And this is just some of the, that data showing from, uh, from our publication in 2017, showing that when we looked at, in this case, we're calling them microparticles here, but microparticles are a form of vesicle that I'll describe later. Um, when we look in the blood, we can find that microparticles are increased in the blood and they carry markers that are representative of microglia after a brain injury. And then if we were to take vesicles that come from microglia and that have been activated in a, into a more pro-inflammatory like condition, we can take those vesicles and inject them into the brain of a mouse. And we can see that there's a lot of activation of microglia here. So uh, the activated microglia kind of have this uh, amoeboid uh, morphology, which is in contrast to their more uh, ramified processes uh, in a control situation. And so additionally, EVs are, as I said before, thought to be, could be, have great potential as, as, as therapeutics. And 
there's a lot of literature out there now um, that have looked at stem cells and going beyond stem cells and looking at the vesicles that stem cells secrete and identifying that a lot of the benefits of stem cell therapy are also replicated in the vesicles that you get from stem cells. Um, and of course, there are other kind of properties that would make these um, more uh, applicable to a, a clinical or translatable scenario over synthetic nanoparticle systems. And as you can see on the left-hand side here, there's multiple ways that EVs have been um, uh, modified to be drug carriers. And that can happen at the level of the cells that are producing the vesicles and modifying the cell in the first place, or you could do it after collecting vesicles and modifying their content um, post-collection. So as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of interest in extracellular vesicles now, and there's been a great boon in research. Um, this is just a quick PubMed search, um, looking at publications with titles with EVs related to them. And really it's been over the last five, uh, five to 10 years that um, EVs have, have skyrocketed in interest. But at the same time, as we have this explosion in interest, um, there is an urgent need for standardization in EV research. And the International Society of Extracellular Vesicles has kind of been at the forefront of, of, of organizing these efforts. And they have some really nice publications that I would recommend if you're interested in learning more. Back in 2014, they had a, a position statement on on, on extracellular vesicles, and then they had an updated version back in 2018. And uh, I'll be talking about some of those considerations when it comes to EV research in the following slides. And so really the, the workflow for EV research kind of looks like this. So um, three main stages. Up front is the sample collection and storage procedure. In the middle is how you isolate your vesicles. And then downstream of that is how you characterize the vesicles, and what kind of uh, other uh, downstream analyses you'd like to do with them, whether you're trying to understand a, a biological function with the vesicles or you're trying to analyze their uh, actual lipid or bi their biological content. And so really to, I won't be talking too much about these uh, pre-analytical variables here, but I will just suffice to say that um, whether it comes to uh, cell culture conditions or when you're isolating um, vesicles from a biological fluid, there are certain uh, parameters that you should be aware of um, that um, would improve the, the quality of the vesicles that you would get from those systems. Um, and so I want to jump right into the different isolation techniques for vesicles. And before we can do that, though, I want to take a minute to, to go over EV nomenclature. And as you can see here, um, there are a lot of different names for vesicles. And I started this presentation, my title has exosomes in it. It's a very cool name. I like it. Um, but really, um, the term extracellular vesicle is the broad term that encompasses any vesicle structure that has that li lipid bilayer that gets released from a cell. But um, not everyone uses that terminology. And as you can see, kind of in 2004, we see this massive spike in, in publications that have exosomes in the term. And then um, there's also a spike here related to microvesicles. And it really isn't until uh, the 2010s where extracellular vesicles start have greater uh, prevalence in the literature. And that's really because been because of the fact of the endorsement through the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And so classically, when we, when we talk about extracellular vesicles, they've been divided into three different subtypes, um, exosomes, microvesicles or microparticles, and apoptotic bodies. And really, this definition historically came from their understanding of their biogenesis, which originally came from imaging studies. So in electron microscopy images, you would see that there's a structure called a, a multifascicular body. And within that multifascicular body, as the name implies, you've got multiple vesicles inside of it. And when this whole structure fuses with the plasma membrane, you get the release of these small particles, which have been classically termed as exosomes. And their size distribution has been defined within this range of uh, below 50 to 200 nanometers in size. And really that classifications come from our understanding of electron microscopy images and also the size limitations that are placed by the fact that they're originating from a, a multivesicular body. For microvesicles, microvesicles um, are shed off of the plasma membrane. So they have a different biogenesis mechanism. And um, they 
can have a range from very small to rather large, even up to one micron. And apoptotic bodies are just uh, vesicles that get released as product part of the natural process when cells undergo apoptosis. Um, there hasn't been as much research in this area uh, and in terms of whether they have any biological function, but uh, most of the research uh, emphasizes focus on exosomes and microvesicles and microparticles. But these definitions were originally based on these biogenesis procedures. And additionally, these definitions have a relation to how they have been isolated. So the gold standard procedure for isolation of vesicles is through ultracentrifugation. And generally, a classic procedure follows multiple differential steps of higher G-force centrifugation. And so in these early steps, you get rid of cell debris, cells and cell debris. And then in this uh, 2000 G step, you'll get larger vesicles, uh, which apoptotic bodies would fall under that category. And then at 10,000 G, you'll get some more medium-sized vesicles, which have been classically associated to be called microvesicles. And then when you take the remaining uh, supernatant and, and spin that down at a really high G-force at 100,000 G, you get what are termed, uh, what have been classically termed as exosomes. But in reality, if we combine these two definitions, the biogenesis definition and the um, isolation-based definition, we find that there's really no current isolation protocol um, that can purify these subpopulations based on biogenesis origin. Um, size isn't an appropriate defining feature either, um, even though people who use the term microvesicles for the, uh, based on physical separation, these would be the medium-sized vesicles. As I showed in this slide, the, these vesicles also have, um, have a significant amount of overlap with, with small vesicles that would be classically termed exosomes. And then the current recommendations are um, through the ISEV is to describe EVs in whatever way you isolate them in terms of their physical characteristics. Primarily size would be that consideration, large, medium, or small EVs, or some biochemical characteristics in terms of what they, what vesicles, what markers the vesicles might carry, or describing them in terms of the their cell of origin or how they were originally, what was the stimulus to induce the, the vesicle production. So um, for example, if you use some sort of growth factor or something to induce vesicle release um, from cells. And so that leads us right into further understanding of extracellular vesicle isolation procedures. And what I'm showing you here is a, an electron microscopy image that we've uh, obtained in our, our core facilities at the University of Maryland, where we've isolated vesicles with uh, a classic ultracentrifugation procedure. And what you see here is this uh, a large EV, uh, maybe about 400 nanometers in size, and it has this characteristic uh, cup shape indentation that you'll see commonly described in the literature. But you also see these other kind of smaller uh, nanoparticle like structures. And originally I thought that these were also EVs as well, but with careful review of the literature, these are in fact actually lipoproteins that are circulating in blood and not vesicles. Um, and this is now well described in the literature over the last few years um, that there is this concern with ultracentrifugation in terms of purity, but it has been the gold standard procedure by which all other analyses are, are, are compared against. And so since that time, there have been a lot of other advances in isolation techniques. Um, so you've got your classic differential ultracentrifugation, but then there's also a density gradient centrifugation, um, size exclusion chromatography, ultrafiltration techniques, as well as immunocapture techniques. And really, all these different isolation methods have different advantages and disadvantages, and they have different levels of recovery and purity. So unfortunately, there isn't a, a gold standard that would be recommended for all particular applications, but depending on your particular needs in terms of what you're doing for your research um, or for your uh, clinical application, one or multiple of these isolation techniques may be appropriate in those circumstances. And so now we'll transition into the uh, downstream analysis here in terms of EV characterization. And that's where uh, Hariba and Buseizer and all these particle characterization techniques are, are really important. And it's also important to understand them in terms of the isolation procedures as well. And so there are a lot of tools in the toolbox here for EV characterization. 
um, just as there are many uh, different isolation procedures. And so um, you, this figure really nicely separates all these different techniques based on whether they are analyzing a physical property of the vesicle or a biochemical property of the vesicle. And I'll also say here that you know when you're considering an, uh, a technology and evaluating extracellular vesicles, you want to look for something or you want to have all these considerations in mind because all these different techniques have varying capabilities for all these different features. So um, one thing you would want to know is the size distribution of the, your vesicles, your particle count or particle concentration of the vesicles, the phenotype of the vesicles. Can you identify particular markers on the vesicles or what kind of cargo is being carried by, by those vesicles? Not as important, but I did add it in here, was uh, EV morphology and visualization to do the techniques actually visualize the particles. And then you also wanna know, does this technique, is it a single particle technique or a bulk particle analysis technique? And then finally, for your characterization, your, your, your technology of choice, does it require an isolation procedure for the vesicles for analysis, or can you directly detect your vesicles from the sample? And this figure also nicely looked at uh, the, the literature over the last five years um, in terms of what most people are doing, uh, are referencing for their characterization techniques. And here it's just showing how many people have, or how many publications have used multiple of these assay types. And here we're showing that for the, for the physical analysis techniques, electron microscopy imaging is very commonly used. Nanoparticle tracking comes in next, dynamic light scattering after that, flow cytometry after that. And so um, what I'll, Describe further is talk about nanoparticle tracking analysis and flow cytometry because these are very uh, common tools used in in the extracellular vesicle field currently, um, as well as highlight a new, a relatively recent technology as well. And so, uh, so in terms of our, and, and I'll say one more thing about this in terms of imaging. While well, imaging has uh, electron microscopy imaging in particular has had so many references in the literature, um, it's very time consuming and, and very expensive to do that. Um, which hence uh, the need for all these different other different characterization techniques that are faster and, and less expensive. And so, uh, as I just said before, um, we're going to look at nanoparticle tracking analysis, flow cytometry, and this relatively new technique uh, uh, called single particle interferometric reflectance imaging. And each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. And for nanoparticle tracking and this uh, SPIRI technique, um, it can do individual particle sizing and counting, but phenotyping of vesicles in terms of markers is something that's still an ongoing uh, development in that space. For flow cytometry, um, there's the advantage of being able to have the ability to use antibodies to, to label vesicles and analyze them in that way, and also the advantage that you can look at them without any prior purification process, um, but there are some issues related to sizing of vesicles and the re resolution limits for, for detection of small ve vesicles in particular that I'll talk about next. So uh, for those that are, aren't familiar with flow cytometry, um, essentially you have a, a sample in a, in a liquid suspension and it'll pass through this core here. Generally for flow cytometry you're looking at cells and you've labeled the cells with some fluorophores. So as these cells come through this hydrodynamically focused uh, stream here, there will be lasers lined up that will excite the cell that's been labeled, and then you'll be able to capture that fluorescence, um, as well as um, general features related to the general light scattering in the forward and the side scatter direction. And so um, this has now been modified to also analyze vesicles as well, um, if you, uh, once you label them with some sort of fluorophore. And you know, in our lab, we use, um, or, or in our at our university, we use the Cytec Aurora, which is in our core facilities, and it is actually pretty quite excellent at looking at small particles. And here I'm showing you a diagram of a very complex bead mixture that has eight different beads in it, and uh, of varying sizes of both silica and uh, polystyrene. And additionally, two of these beads have a fluorescent label in them, and so. Um, by flow cytometry, you can get very nice uh, separation of the fluorescent beads from the non-fluorescent beads, as well as when you're looking at the, the side scatter profile, uh, you can see that there's a, a distinct separation based on, on size. 
But one of the main drawbacks with, with flow cytometry is that a lot of people or a lot of researchers use these beads as their gating strategies to determine the size of a vesicle. So, for example, if you've got a, if you do these beads, you run these beads up front and you've got this sort of data here, then you might draw a, a line from here to here and say, well, okay, when I look at my vesicle sample, I've got vesicles between 180 to 240 nanometers in size. And unfortunately, that's not accurate because um, this, the scattering principles are dependent on the refractive index of the, the materials that you're using. And there is a major difference in the refractive index of polystyrene, silica, and even biological nanoparticles. The refractive index actually decreases um, as you go down there. And so um, there was a, in the flow cytometry field, there was a shift from using polystyrene beads to silica beads, but it's also understood that silica beads are still not sufficient for accurate sizing of extracellular vesicles, uh, of biological particles that have much lower refractive index. And this is just an example as well with our own data here where we've taken a sample and we've stained it with a marker. Um, in this case, it's a CD81, which is highly present in vesicles, and we've analyzed it by flow cytometry and uh, in two different conditions. And so the gating strategy I've drawn here is based on the B gating in the in the previous slide. And as you can see with the, the histogram here, uh, the majority of the, the vesicles are of small size. And in fact, they're very low fluorescent signal. And likely there's a lot of cutoff of many of these small vesicles um, below that detection limit. So beyond that, there's been a recent advance in technology using uh, antibody-based capture from NanoView Biosciences, and that's called the ExoView R100 tech that we also have in our lab. And um, this technology is a chip-based platform where you capture vesicles on a chip um, based on antibodies that are printed on the chip. And you, uh, currently they're, they're printed for the most common proteins that are in, in extracellular vesicles like CD9, CD6, CD3, and CD81. And um, it's got a, an imaging component to it as well. And you can get these really beautiful images. In this case, we're looking at a antibody spot that has been coated with CD9. And we have a sample of plasma that was put on it and then washed off and then counterstained with some fluorescent antibodies to generate the image here. And you can get really nice fluorescent labeling in, that, in, in this case. And this represents a, a major advance from flow cytometry, which will miss a lot of these uh, smaller particles that have these, these particular markers. Now I want to transition into nanoparticle tracking analysis for EVs. And this has been used extensively in EV research since probably as early as like 2004. And the principle of uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis is that you have a sample of your, your vesicles in a solution, and then a laser is shown through that sample. And as the laser shines through it, um, it'll hit the particles, and those particles will scatter light, just like in flow cytometry. But you'll actually capture that light scatter uh, with a microscope, and then it will be imaged on a camera such that you can get these really cool videos here and looks like unfortunately i won't be able to play this video here but this is a screenshot of of what you would see with nanoparticle tracking analysis and if i were able to play the video what you'd see is that these particles would all just be moving just like my laser pointer is moving right now and that movement's referred to as brownian motion and there's well-known mathematical and physical principles that characterize the relationship between the Brownian motion of these small particles in solution to their size. And so what nanoparticle tracking analysis does is it will record videos of the nanoparticles in solution, and then uh, it'll be able to track the particle's motion, and it'll then be used to calculate a diffusion coefficient. And through this relationship and with all these other factors here held constant, um, we can determine the size of the particle. And so at the time, NTA represented a really important advance over DLS systems um, for, for particle characterization. And additionally, uh, NTA provided a single particle analysis of nanoparticle systems, whereas dynamic light scattering was more of a bulk analysis of your particles in solution. And that's represented here in this, in this figure where 
um, you've got two different uh, size particles in this mixture, and they're measured by either NTA or dynamic light scattering. And NTA in red does a really nice job of, of separating the two different bead populations, whereas DLS, since it doesn't actually work at a, a single particle level, it will look at it a, as a bulk aggregate, and you'll find that the particles are somewhere, particle size distribution is somewhere in, the, in, in between. So at the time, NTA represented a really important, useful tool for not only nanoparticle, the nanoparticle industry, but also for extracellular vesicles that were research that was really gaining steam in the early 2000s. There was still, um, at the time, NTA was only in a single laser format. And there were issues in terms of the accuracy of the polydispersed, uh, of, of, of counting and sizing a polydispersed sample. And that's where the most recent advance uh, came over the last few years um, with the ViewSizer 3000 that was originally uh, created under Manta and is now distributed by Hariba. And the advancement here is that ViewSizer uses three different lasers to simultaneously visualize the nanoparticle samples. And I'll, I'll leave that discussion for, for another webinar within the particle characterization series in terms of why using three lasers improves the polydispersed capability. But what I'll do is I'll show you the data that I've generated in my own hands um, that highlight that function. So we can take this polydispersed uh, mixture of beads that we first analyzed by flow cytometry, where we've got eight different bead populations, two that are fluorescent and six that are non-fluorescent. And this is just a screenshot image of the, of the beads in with a view sizer, and you can see all different kind of sizes here. And then on the right-hand side, you see the particle size distribution. And then it does a really nice job of uh, capturing all the different peaks of the distribution. And and even in this area where you, you're trying to distinguish 110 nanometer uh, beads from 300 nanometer beads, they can really see all those different populations there. One of the great advancements with this uh, with the view sizer technology has been the uh, capability of, of fluorescence NTA. So um, in this case, you're just using the lasers to illuminate the sample and then the light gets scattered and captured by the camera to visualize what you see here. But if you add an additional component where you only, you, you can use the laser, but then you add a, a filter in between. And this way now you can capture only the emitted wavelength from the fluorescent signal. And so in this case, uh, it's the same sample, but now we've added a filter in between. And now we're only capturing the two polystyrene beads here that are fluorescent at the 110 and 500 nanometer sizes. And again, it does a really nice job of identifying those two populations. And then just to confirm that this wasn't a unique feature to the view sizer itself, you can compare the, the performance of a view sizer to conventional single laser NTA. And actually, before I get into that, uh, I'll mention that there's an, an important relationship between the laser wavelength that you use and the particles that you can de detect in solution. So this is an example of vesicles that I've isolated from plasma. And it's the same sample, but I'm illuminating the, the sample with one laser at a time with view sizer. And so um, as you can see from going from red, green to blue, it's the same sample, but you see a lot more particles with the blue. And that's dem also demonstrated here with the particle size distribution. And not only that, you see more particles, you see particles that are of smaller sizes. And so um, if you were to only analyze this sample with a red laser only, you would find that the average size is about 178 nanometers with a median at 153. But in reality, um, with the, when you use a blue laser to help you visualize the smaller particles, you see that the real size distribution is actually shifted towards the smaller sizes. And, and this is true for many different biological systems, including vesicles too. When you isolate vesicles, uh, the majority of the peak distribution is, is shifted towards smaller sizes and really hits the, the limit of detection of many different systems, about, about 50 nanometers in sizes as, as based on imaging and based on other techniques put together, it seems to be the peak distribution when you consider all vesicles that are released uh, in a system. And so this is the comparison here with, with the nanosite. So to just make sure that this wasn't a, a unique feature to ViewSizer, um, you can compare 
uh, view sizer with uh, a nanosite LM10 that was fitted with a red laser and compare their particle size distributions. And again, it's the same sample, but the particle size distribution by nanosite shown in these maroon circles here really nicely matches the particle size distribution that would be viewed, that would be determined by view sizer if you only use the red laser. But the advantage and the advancement here is that if you have more lasers in the system, you catch all the smaller, smaller particles that you couldn't visualize beforehand. And so while NTA has been in the field for uh, as, as long as the EV field has really been around since the early 2000s, the, this advancement with, with Manta is, is really important because the biggest advantages you can get with uh, nanoparticle tracking compared to other sorts of EV characterization tech is that you get very accurate counting and sizing of the individual particles in solution, and um, the additional ability to have fluorescence with NTA opens the possibility to label vesicles with other kinds of, with either fluorescent dyes or with, uh, with antibodies to help distinguish EVs from contaminants if you um, have a sample that might have that situation, or you use an isolation procedure that has, that is not as pure as other ones. And that's also one of the limitations of NTA. So for the data you get from NTA for vesicles, you want to make sure that you use a procedure that's got uh, a very high purity because otherwise, if it's got other contaminants and they're in the nanoparticle size range, you're also going to be measuring that as well. And also the minimum size for detecting biologics. So currently it's reported to be about 50 nanometers in size, um, which is which matches what the current uh, major size distribution for, for vesicle, uh, vesicles are especially the exosomes or the small vesicles that the majority of research is, is centered around in this, in this area. And then in terms of future directions, you know, the design features for fluorescence and also for the scattering mode to improve detection of smaller particles is always something that could be advanced in, in the future. And then really importantly, can we add the ability to, to add phenotyping capabilities to NTA to add that feature to not only have sizing capabilities, counting capabilities, but also phenotyping capabilities all within one single system itself. So with that, I'd like to um, close by, by thanking my mentor team at the University of Maryland, both at the School of Medicine, as well as at College Park in the engineering department, and then really thank Ariba Scientific, and in particular, Bill, Sean, Jeff, for getting me involved uh, in terms of the early steps with, with the Manta View Sizer, and, uh, and, and Kuba Tardokiewicz, Tardo who helped me understand some of the, the physical principles behind NTA and why this uh, was a major advancement in, in the NTA field. And also thank Julie for, for hosting this webinar and for, for getting me to give me the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, and so I hope in summary, I've given you a, a kind of a, a broad overview of vesicles, why they're very interesting and why they, um, what the challenges and uh, what are the current limitations within the field and uh, what the future directions are for that. And with that, I'll um, you know, take any, any questions that the audience might have. Well, thank you, Niaz, for the excellent webinar. And Thank you for making me a PhD today. <laughs> um, I do want to mention, since you talked about it in your webinar, Dr. Sean Travers will be discussing more about the multi-laser NTA, the ViewSizer 3000, on July 22nd. Um, and that's the webinar we'll, where we're going to focus more on the technique and an array of applications that it covers, such as nano gold, nano bubbles, virus, et cetera, as opposed to today we're focusing on exosome. So let me go ahead and move on to the Q&A um, session. This question came in earlier in your webinar. It says, um, can EVs have some significance in individualization? And then part two of the question is, if we perform genomic studies, how visible is it? So, excellent question. And, and if I understand correctly, it sounds like um, the idea of personalized medicine, and, and that's a big area in, in generally in medicine, and exosomes and vesicles in general are a part of that. The feasibility in terms of the, the genomics characterization um, really is limited by the, the genomics field itself in terms of the analytics, the high throughput analytics of, 
characterizing uh, all these different species within vesicles themselves. But that's certainly a, a major area of interest to use vesicles for, for personalized medicine. So on one end, you could use it for biomarker and disease detection. And on the other end, uh, could there be a situation in the future where um, vesicles from your own body could be used to create a medicine that could be useful for you? Thank you. Okay, and then the other question is, can you mention a little bit more about exosomes' biochemical pathways of interaction with your target genes or enzymes in photosynthetic plants or in human cells cure rate? Yeah, so uh, another great question. And really there, as I showed in one of the slides earlier, or if you just kind of have this mental picture with me here, is that you know, you've got one, two cells, and one cell is going to release a vesicle that goes out into the system, and then it's going to be taken up by another cell and affect its function. And currently, the majority of the research, the vast majority of the research has been done in cell culture systems. So we, you're in the lab, and you've got cells growing in culture, and then they're releasing vesicles into the media that they're they're bathed in, and then you collect the vesicles from that, and then you put it on another vesicle, uh, or sorry, you put it on a, a different cell type, and then you analyze, well, does this, do the vesicles that I've transferred um, affect the cell, uh, the, the recipient cell in that situation? So a lot of what we know currently is based on those kinds of studies. Um, it hasn't been until more recently with advancements in terms of animal models and in vivo um, visualization of vesicles, because um, everything I discussed today was about when you take vesicles out of a, of a system, whether it's from a, a biological fluid or from a cell culture system, and then you analyze it afterwards. But can we potentially track and visualize where vesicles are going when they're in an in vivo system? And, and, and that's on, in the works. And in terms of the targeting question, it's a very important question. The idea that could a vesicle, at least at the local level, we know that within a cell that's next to another cell, there could be a release of vesicle and it doesn't have to travel very far to be taken up by the next cell. But the idea that they're in circulation, could a vesicle that comes from one place, like the brain, get into the blood and then could it go to your liver? Could you go to your spleen and your lung? And the answer seems to be yes. Uh, we need a lot more work in terms of understanding all the different places that vesicles from uh, one starting point uh, go to. But um, there's some really good examples of this sort of long distance communication. But in terms of whether we know the targeting mechanisms are still not completely understood. But those that are interested in therapeutics have been able to already take advantage of that fact because if they know that there is a particular molecule that's on their cell that they need to deliver. The, the, the therapeutic to, you could create a vesicle that has a, a targeting moiety on it that would you know, recognize your cell of interest. And in that way, you can get more preferential uptake within that particular cell type. And there's good data already showing that. But in terms of also whether we understand that in the body, that's still under further investigation. And then the last part of that question, so there's a lot of different things there, but whether what happens or when it gets to another cell, wh what's going on there? So you know, there's multiple different ways it could communicate with the other cell. So it could communicate via an interaction at the membrane surface to stimulate some signaling transduction pathways inside the cell. It could get taken up by the cell and then the contents could be released and those contents could have direct functions based on what kind of species of RNA or protein that it is. But uh, there's a lot of different ways that, uh, that we're still trying to understand in terms of how vesicles communicate with each other in those details. Thank you. Um, any references you would recommend that describe techniques to manipulate the characteristics of EV produced by cells? Yes. Um, and in fact, if uh, you know Julie agrees, I can um, provide those in the slides that will be posted um, online later. And I can say that there there's some really good groups out there that have that are in this space in terms of manipulating cells to improve their vesicle production, um, whether it's with moving into bioreactor type systems or using fluidics-based systems to improve the efficiency of vesicle release. 
and, 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 and isolation. Um, and then also the, the references within this presentation earlier regarding the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles, those um, two papers are, are really important for the field and provide a very good overview of the entire field where it stands currently and will also lead you down the path of finding maybe some other references that would be of, of greater interest. And then additionally, there's some nice video series online as well that go into much greater depth than what I could provide here on, on all the different topics on, on, on isolation, on characterization, particular characterization techniques. And, and I can provide all of those in, in the slides that I'll be posted. Or if you have more specific questions that you'd like to discuss offline, you can send us an email at labinfo@hariba.com. Moving on to the next question, what do you think of stem cell, stem cell derived exosomes being used in anti-aging treatments? Uh, very good question. I don't know the specifics for anti-aging in particular, but I do know that pretty much you can pick any disease condition or any um, disease or condition, and someone probably has tried looking at stem cell exosomes and identifying whether they have some beneficial function. And I would say the large majority of them have shown that they do have some beneficial function, and it's related to their stem -like, cell-like property. I, uh, I'm not as familiar in terms of the research uh, in the aging space, um, but there's some really good studies on the biomedical research side to understand aging and how vesicles are involved in that naturally. And there's some nice studies that are showing that there are certain cells in the brain may be very important for producing vesicles that at this point at least correlate with an aging phenotype. And maybe potentially with greater understanding, um, we could be able to design or engineer a therapeutic that could take advantage of those uh, that physiological understanding to manipulate some of the diseases that are associated with, with aging over time, such as you know, neurodegenerative diseases and other uh, sorts of like inflammatory diseases like arthritis and, and the like. But it's, it's very promising, but it, it's still very early. And, and a lot of those, those limitations at this point are in terms of the purification of vesicles and getting that standardization uh, of vesicles, just like any other therapeutic that would be produced. Uh, being able to purify it, provide the accurate characterization of what you're, you've purified, and then also identifying what's the final biological activity of what you've isolated. Thank you. Okay, so this next question is quite specific. It says, okay, for in vivo work with exosomes, can the exosomes be a source of pathogen or contaminants? For instance, if the cell line is contaminated with a rotent virus, could this virus be transmitted via the exosome from the cell line? I would say it's very likely it can be. And the, the reason I would say that is because uh, viruses actually hijack this entire vesicle pathway system. In fact, there's a very strong connection between our understanding of virus um, transmission, viral transmission, and EVs. And, and there's some really good groups that are in that space where they're studying both. They may have started in, in the virology field in analyzing viruses, but then were able to also pick up vesicles and exosomes and then realize that there's a major overlap between the two. So yes, viruses do use vesicle machinery. So uh, that is uh, a consideration in, in that particular situation that vesicles would get released, uh, sorry, viruses would get released in vesicles and could get transmitted through that fashion. Thank you. And then in the interest of time, I, I do want to couple these three questions together where the attendee is asking, can you describe a little bit more about purification options uh, or exosome production? Uh, they're very interested in that space um, for purification. Gotcha. And uh, thank you for this question. So what I'll do is I'll spend a little bit more time then on this particular slide. So looking back at this, because I think this is a really nice summary of all the different the major players here and their advantages and disadvantages so um, as i said before differential centrifugation has been the the primary method that's been used uh, since the beginning of, of of analyzing vesicles but not everyone has access to an ultra centrifuge and uh, on top of that uh, there's the major issue in terms of contamination and i think it's well established and well uh, recognized that 
ultra centrifugation based isolation from either a cell culture system or from biological system uh, will, is not very pure. It'll, it'll have either protein aggregates, lipoproteins if you're in blood, or also in cell culture. So the advance on that has been to then use density gradient ultra centrifugation. So to separate it out further based on density differences. Um, and that is good. It does create a cleaner population. But again, it's it's much it's more time consuming and does require access to an ultra centrifuge. The next major isolation technique that has really gained a lot of interest and use use is size exclusion chromatography, and uh, that's faster than ultra centrifugation. But its major limitation might be well, if you're interested in some of the smaller vesicles, um, you may lose those vesicles because some of these columns, the pore sizes are designed in a way that they would capture the small particles because they're trying to capture like proteins and other particles that are in that small size range. But uh, unfortunately, the vesicle size distribution also overlaps in that range. And so you would you would clean out the sample by removing the, the impurities, but you would lose small vesicles. But what you could, what, what you would have coming through is a clean vesicle population, but it would be maybe skewed a little bit more towards the, the medium and large size vesicles. But again, that may not be uh, an issue depending on your particular application. And then lastly, um, immunocapture, immunofinity techniques have been, are, are also gaining a lot of interest. And so these are based on very specific capture of vesicles that have certain markers on them. And as you can imagine, that can be very pure because it's based on that technique, an antibody-based technique, but you're just going to be very selective. So um, it depends on your downstream application. Maybe for someone who is interested in identifying a particular molecule in a vesicle of interest that's coming from a particular cell type, that might be beneficial then to use a immunocapture, immunoprecipitation technique where you would you would isolate the vesicles that only have that marker on it and then you would further analyze the RNA content or the uh, protein content of those vesicles for, for further uh, understanding. Thank you. Okay, can we take one more question? This one seems to be really short before we wrap up. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. So there are publications out there describing synthetic exosomes. Can synthetically developed nanoparticles be classified as EV? So in this case, uh, I would we would probably distinguish the two still because um, if I understand with the, the synthetic nanoparticle, that would be created artificially, whereas if the synthetic EVs that you're describing here could be coming from a bio original biological source from a cell, and it would also have to have the lipid bilayer. So I think the majority of synthetic nanoparticle systems are of the liposome variety, which may not have a, a lipid bilayer structure and may just start from lipids in a solution, purified lipids. So I, I think it would probably, there'll be a division in terms of those classifications. Um, and also I would imagine for regulatory purposes and therapeutic purposes with the with the FDA, they would separate the two as, as, as slightly different based on their origin. Great, thank you. So for those of you, um, we ran out of time, but we'll address your questions um, individually and feel free to reach out to us at labinfo at hariba.com um, for any questions, additional questions or feedback that you may have. And thank you so much, Niaz. Is there anything else that you want to add, Niaz? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Have a great day and we'll see you at one or more of our future webinars. Bye, everyone.